Welcome um, to all of you. Uh, thank you for joining us. Welcome to those of you who are joining us virtually online. Um, I'm Leslie Vinjori. Uh, I direct the US and Americas program here at Tottenham House. I'm also dean of our academy and an academic member of the faculty at SOAS, University of London. Um, I am not James Nixie, for those of you who dialed in. James, my colleague, um, is in the Balkans. Vilnius. 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 Okay, and, and he is here in spirit. He certainly, um, he reached out to you and you to him, uh, and he is totally part of this, but unfortunately uh, couldn't be here today, so I'm here. Um, I am very honored to be chairing you in particular. Thank you for making the trip. It's not something that we will ever take for granted ever again, <laughs> not only in the case of you, but in the case of all of our guests. Eugene Rumer is a senior fellow and director of Carnegie's Russia and Eurasia program, obviously based in Washington, D.C., although you're one of the global think tanks, so I guess it's not always That's right. obvious um, and, uh, and something very special about the Carnegie Endowment is that you do have offices uh, around the world. Um, but you are very well known, of course, for your expertise on Russia and Eurasia. Uh, prior to joining Carnegie, you were the National Intelligence Officer for Russia and Eurasia at the U.S. National Intelligence Council. That was 2010 to 2014. You've also worked at the National Defense University, IISS, so you're familiar with London. Um, we're friends, not competitors, so that you know. Uh, RAN Corporation, and you served um, on the National Security Council staff and at the State Department. So you bring a tremendous amount of expertise. You haven't managed to solve the problem, though, of U.S.-Russia relations. So deep expertise, but a hard nut to crack. Um, and you're here to speak with us today, U.S.-Russia relations possibilities and limits. Now, this is not my core area, but anybody who works on U.S. foreign policy, of course, works on Russia. Um, and I was very curious as I um, as I looked back at your recent writings on Nord Stream 2, you have not the conventional understanding of Nord Stream 2 that John makes in Washington. I'm hoping that you'll talk to us about that. Uh, I think it's safe to say we are um, perhaps once again at one of the most difficult points in U.S.-Russia relations. That would be interesting to hear your views on that. Um, and in particular, I'm very curious as to whether you will have a comment on whether the so-called two-track uh, strategy is working for President Biden in his approach to Russia. But we look forward to your comments. We're on the record, I should say that. We're on the record, and um, we're not under the Chatham House rule. Um, so please feel free to cite Eugene in your, in your conversations. Over to you. Well, thank you very much, Leslie. And really, I'm delighted and honored to be here. Uh, to be back here, um, I mean, it's really great to be in London. It's great to be in Chatham House. And see some very familiar, very distinguished faces around the table. Um, and, uh, um, you know, I should say that uh, you know, James and I went back and forth a couple of times on the title for the talk. And those of you I can see in this room are seasoned observers of Russia and bilateral US Russian relations and Russian European relations and Russian British relations. Now, um, uh, are probably much more familiar with the limits of the relationship uh, than with the possibilities. So we keep thinking about the possibilities, um, but as you just said, we haven't really solved the problem and the conversation always um, uh, returns to the limits of the relationship. Um, I was told to be brief um, and I will try to keep myself to about 10, 12 minutes. Uh, so I still have plenty of room for conversation in the Q&A. Um, and, um, uh, and uh, you know, you refer to the Biden administration policy as perhaps two track um, these days. Uh, again, they didn't invent this. I think um, it's a uh, uh, theme um, in the US Russian relations over the past 30 years since the breakup of the Soviet Union, that uh, there's always been a track of um, holding Russia's feet to the fire on some issues but also holding out opportunities and the possibility of closer cooperation. Um, the record, as you pointed out, of the last three years is not great. Um, there have been a lot more disappointments and uh, hope and opportunities for the relationship to move forward. And I'm afraid that's where we are once again. Um, and um, 
I would argue that after our experience over the past 30 years, with the highs and the lows in the bilateral relationship with every new administration coming in, pledging to turn the page, move the relationship to a higher plane, and make it much more productive and much more in the interest of the American people, and by extension for the you know, Russian people as well, uh, every administration left the White House uh, profoundly disappointed. I mean, it literally is the case where you recall that in the early 90s, there was a spirit of partnership and optimism early in the Clinton administration that ended on a very sour note, you know, 2000, 2001 time frame with the war in Chechnya resuming with the arms control, uh, bilateral arms control in a difficult place. Uh, and Vladimir Putin uh, following in the footsteps of President Yeltsin at the time. There was the uh, uptick in a relationship during the Bush years which was followed uh, fast forward to 2008 in the war with Georgia. There was the same reset with President Obama and President Ben Medvedev, and that again it ended with uh, not the, the relationship that ended up uh, being so you know again at the worst place in the worst place since the end of the Cold War after the 2014 illegal annexation of Crimea by Russia and the start of the undeclared war finished in Ukraine by Russia, which continues to the present day. So the good news, I would say that uh, I'm, I'll skip over Trump because we all know, so still fresh in our minds, that unfortunate experience of one again, off again in that relationship over four years. But it's fair to say that at the end of the Trump administration, the relationship once again was at an even lower point than it was in the beginning. Uh, the good news is that the Biden administration, from what I can tell, really um, had no illusions at the outset that somehow you could turn the page and get to a new reset and get to a promising uh, time in a relationship with major opportunities. Um, I would say that uh, the relationship, I'm jumping a bit ahead of myself, I think it's still where we are some months later, the relationship is about as good as it gets. Uh, and I give credit to the Biden administration for not having illusions, but for returning it to a plane where it can be managed. I don't believe the relationship can be fixed uh, to where perhaps it was in the earlier, and more optimistic uh, phases during previous decades. But I do believe that they're doing a pretty good job managing it. And um, that in itself is going to be a handful given my reading of tea leaves of where Russia is and where the administration is these days as well. Uh, so, um, you know, they did the important thing uh, of renewing the new start within literally just a few days of assuming office. That was the immediate, immediate necessary step to make to preserve the last remaining bilateral arms control treaty between the United States and the Russian Federation. And after that, it seemed to me that you know, there weren't a whole lot of opportunities to deal with Russia to make progress, and there weren't any immediate crises. But very quickly, uh, the Kremlin reminded the Biden administration that this is not a relationship that you could put in the box and manage with, you know, kind of on a part-time uh, basis, uh, even if you factor in the big domestic agenda uh, of the Biden administration that are articulated in the beginning. And that reminder to the Kremlin and to Kiev came in the form of a major military buildup on the border of Ukraine in March and April. And in a sense, I would say it proved to be quite successful for uh, the Kremlin. Uh, there were two messages that went out, one to Kiev, we can crush it, and one to Washington. Uh, we will get to the top of your agenda, regardless um, of what you think you may do uh, unilaterally. So the effectiveness of the message to Washington was demonstrated uh, with the Geneva summit. I am not privy to the administration thinking, but my impression is that an early meeting with Vladimir Putin to look him in the eyes and to tell him whatever was not necessarily high on President Biden's agenda, but it was done. Um, and um, it was done uh, quite effectively given the state and the direction of the relationship overall. Um, you know, a conversation was restarted on strategic arms control for real and on strategic stability, which again is extremely important 
for both countries, uh, something that had not happened prior to just a couple of months ago during the Trump administration with any seriousness. The conversation was started for real on cyber issue on how to regulate the relationship between the United States and Russia in the cyber domain, which uh, is a hugely important uh, issue, needless to say, and something that's going to be very difficult. Plus, a uh, conversation where they started uh, for real, uh, because it didn't take place at all during the Trump administration, uh, on uh, JCPOA, Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action on Iran, which is a very, very important administration priority, as we know. Uh, so um, I, I would say that all these moves fall into the category of manage, but not fix, in part because I don't see this relationship as something that really can be fixed. You know, I'm watching the clock here. Um, all of these issues, let's say strategic stability and arms control, are going to be difficult to achieve tangible results on, in part because of the domestic political constraints in the United States. And this being the United States program, I don't think I need to really explain that with a Senate split 50-50, <laughs> any new arms control treaty with Russia is unlikely to uh, get a lot of support, let alone get past the uh, uh, ratification mark. Um, the cyber conversation, by definition, is extremely problematic, and there are constantly new reports coming out about what the administration clearly sees as Russian misbehavior. E even without going into the whole uh, set of issues having to do with cyber crime, but just regulating what is an acceptable and what is not an acceptable position uh, activity in the cyber domain, that's something that's going to be very difficult uh, to arrive at in, in a, a clear and effective way notwithstanding the two governments' joint action at the United Nations to propose a resolution, uh, I, I, I think that uh, is more, um, I'll use the term perhaps, not very politely, but I think putting more lipstick on a pig. But the problem still remains a pig. Uh, that's not necessarily going to be fixed. Um, I should also note that there's been a, call it a reversal of fortunes Again, turning to the uh, America side or the United States side of you know of this conversation and program, um, you know the Biden administration is facing a very different sort of domestic set of political constraints with apparently theory the Washington Post on a daily basis. Uh, the big social you know domestic programs that the administration had articulated early on seem to be um, uh, let's just say the future is very dicey, problematic, and that doesn't leave a whole lot of time for the administration to focus on pressing foreign policy issues. Uh, the administration took a hit after Afghanistan. Um, uh, so, um, you know, it's, 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 it's difficult going on the U.S. side. On the Russia side, I think we see a much more confident, self-confident Kremlin with... Um, you know, they dodged a few bullets on Nord Stream 2. Uh, they dodged their significant reputational bullet with Navalny not getting the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, Europe is begging for more gas, something that is a dramatic reversal of fortunes from just the pre-pandemic days. And I should say oil is, what, about $85 a barrel when the Russian budget is... Uh, projected to balance at 40 some dollars a barrel. So, uh, you know, the, the coffers are once again uh, filling up and they do have very substantial reserves uh, to the tune of, I think these days, close over, over $800 billion all told. So um, they're feeling pretty good. So they're not in the mood to make a whole lot of concessions. So, and if you listen to, uh, you know, President Putin's speech at the recent Valdai Forum, certainly, uh, you know, he is uh, leads me to believe that, again, there's not going to be any kind of breakthrough, any kind of push on the Russian side uh, to get to, uh, you know, a series of meaningful deliverables with the United States. Uh, and some of it really has to do, as I see it, with 
uh, three uh, structural, some structural, some personal constraints to a more productive relationship, we call the possibilities in this relationship. Um, one of this is personal, one of this is generational, and one of these really is structural. So personal, I, you know, to the extent that I can read, we can all try what's on Mr. Putin's mind. Clearly, you know, the man who uttered 20, you know, 15 years or so ago that the breakup of the Soviet Union was the geopolitical, greatest geopolitical catastrophe of, um, of the 20th century, um, I would say that remains his unfinished business. He's not going anywhere. We keep guessing what time, when, what year, when, when will he step down? Uh, clearly, he's positioned to remain in office indefinitely. And I would argue that this agenda is probably going to be high on his personal um, uh, business agenda. Generational, he's of a generation that really probably came to believe that the Soviet Union was it, that the breakup of the Soviet Union was a catastrophe, the generation of people that he represents and the particular segment of people he represents, uh, they did well under the old regime. They did even better in the past 20 years since Mr. Putin yes. came to power. But in terms of self-assessment, self-perception as, um, as a great power, I think those were the days and they think about those days. And third, structural, I would say that if you look back at the history of the Russian state and how traditionally Russian generations after generations of Russian leaders thought about uh, national security, strategic depth, control of the territory around the periphery of the Russian state has been an essential factor in how they view the security world. After NATO enlargement, well, to get a breakup of the Soviet Union in NATO enlargement, the border of Russia is where it had been for a number of centuries, depending on how you count, since the Brest Treaty of 1918, or possibly since the early days of the Russian state and the uh, uh, late 17th century. And the fact that, uh, as Putin, I believe, said it well done, it's not so much, I'm paraphrasing, it's not so much Ukraine and NATO, but NATO in Ukraine. That's something that I think represents a structural impediment to a better relationship between Russia and the West. And that's where really the rubber meets the road. So it's not something that can be fixed. Uh, but it can only be managed. And once again, I give a good amount of credit for the administration for you know, paying attention to this issue uh, and managing it uh, quite ably for the time being. Well, I'm with, I'll mm -hmm. stop with that. Um, uh, thank you once again, Russ. So it's very, it's, it's excellent. And thank you very much. I mean, I, I'm, I'm glad that you, that you set this out, um, structure, personal, uh, and generational, because of course, you know, I had written down, got to ask the structural question, which of course is the thing that we all always wanted to drill down on when it comes to US Russia relations. But thank you for raising that. Um, I guess let me ask a question and then I will open it up to all of you and to all of you online. Um, and I want to ask, you know, the, I guess I, I mean, I have so many questions. I, I do kind of want to ask the China question without taking you too far away from, only because you didn't ask it, it's sort of always going to be yelled at, at the moment. How much does that matter? It, how much do you think that actually factors in to the strategy that US, the U.S. is pursuing with respect to Russia? Does it create... Um, shortcomings in U.S. strategy? Does it hinder U.S. strategic focus or you know, the, the, the instruments that the U.S. is willing to engage with or use or deploy? And if you could kind of touch on it again, I know it's not in the title, but given that we're sitting here in London, um, we're now in the U.K., we're also sometimes in Europe, depending on how you define Europe. Um, but, you know, Europe has a dog in this fight. Um, there's a good question about UK and global Britain and, you know, whether global is too global and Europe should focus on Russia so that can America can you know, further beyond. So what is, what is your sort of take on how China alters or has set the context for this relationship, especially in the current period and what, what role for the UK? Um, so there are a couple of ways to answer this one. I mean, clearly, 
it doesn't take an expert uh, uh, to arrive at the conclusion that China is the overwhelming strategic challenge, over, you know, relative to other strategic challenges that we face on our agenda, including China. By far the most important strategic challenge that we face. Um, and uh, just to put a plug in for the work that the Carnegie Endowment has done, uh, but everyone is doing this work, but I would say that Devin Feigenbaum, my colleague, is Vice President for Asia and Carnegie has done some really interesting work and continues to do a work on China and Asia more broadly. So I think there is a sense among um, Washington general foreign policy experts and strategic community we defined that the real challenge is that Russia is a second tier issue relative to where China is. And clearly, given the interconnected nature of our two economies and the fact that Russia and the United States do about 25, somebody correct me if I'm wrong, or $30 billion worth of bilateral trade annually, which is a fraction of what US, uh, um, uh, China, US China trade is. You know, there, there's no comparison yet. You know, uh, so, so that tends to color the way we think about this problem. And I imagine, I'm not in government, but I imagine that it really dominates uh, the attention, the mind, the, the agenda of all our senior policymakers. Um, it's funny, uh, uh, a chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff uh, noticed when he had to, um, uh, General Milley reportedly um, uh, felt compelled to call his Chinese counterparts uh, around the time of, uh, you know, the, uh, around, around the time of uncertainty in the U.S. domestic politics, shall we put it this way? Somehow, I wonder if he didn't feel compelled to call Gerasimov <laughs> with the same uh, set of issues. But I think it also tells you where kind of the, the, the focus of the strategic community is. That said, you know, Russia clearly has a way, as I just pointed out, of reminding us that um, it's still here and it still needs to be managed. There is... There was, I think, for a number of years, still you hear these voices about the need to ease up on Russia in order to bring it over to uh, the U.S. side in this trilateral, triangular relationship. Um, I, uh, I, 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 have, I have a very different view on that. I, I think that um, this um, idea that somehow we can entice Russia to join our camp is, uh, as someone else put it, magical thinking. Um, I think it's a vast misunderstanding and actually even slight, slighting of Russia because the Russian-Chinese strategic relationship is really strategic um, and is, sound that in very, is grounded in very sound realities. There is the economic relationship. There is the personal relationship between Mr. Putin and Mr. Xi which in those political systems is not trivial. There is political complementarity between the two. And there's the shared adversary in the United States. And also, you know, their geopolitical priorities really do not overlap. For Russia, it's still Europe, however you define Europe. Uh, for China, it's Asia Pacific. It's something that we tend to forget, but I think it's, a, it's an important fact to remember that the normalization of Russian-Chinese relations going back all the way to the late 80s or 90s, was a tremendous breakthrough for them. At the height of the Cold War, each side kept as many, more than 50 divisions on the border. So I think uh, uh, we tend to forget how much uh, China helped us win the Cold War by really imposing an unmanageable burden on the Soviet economy. So yes, it does affect our thinking, China that is, but um, um, any, any sort of idea that somehow we can entice Russia and join us to, to, to join our lines is, is not going to uh, work. Well, let Sorry, me just add, add, no, no, that's good. I just want to add one comment on that before I come to the first question. And I'm sure that people in the room have questions as well. So please just you know make yourself known. Um, the uh, you know the moderator team, the sort of 
dialed down version of what I guess people are calling the wedge strategy, you know, take policy, whether it's arms control or whatever, to kind of drive a wedge between Russia and China. Isn't isn't necessarily that that's going to leave Russia to be in our camp, but maybe it can create an opening or make make us make the US seem less as a as an as an aggressive power that that you know drives Russia that much closer. So it's a, maybe it's a question of degrees as opposed to um, you know, actually pulling Russia all the way over to you know, the US side of the ledger as it were. Right. So you know, I think there are a number of areas where perhaps we don't need to do certain things for two years or keep doing the same thing over and over again, knowing that it hasn't worked in the past um, in, in dealing our dealings with Russia. That said, I would say that insecurity um, um, in our relationship from the Russian side is built into that structure of the current standoff between NATO and Russia. And I don't think that you can easily somehow compensate for that without really a major compromise on what our NATO commitments are and what our political commitments are to countries like Ukraine, for example. Thank you. Okay, let me come to uh, to Ewan Grant and then to Arusia. So Ewan, who is the Customs and Border Control Consultant, has worked in Ukraine, Moldova, and Central Asia, perhaps you know, uh, writes, state-protected cyber attacks and revelations likely in the U.S. in 2022 about other Russian state cooperation, seriously harmful criminality. I think that's a hard thing. What discussion has the U.S. been having with allies about responses and potential Russian counteractions, perhaps including hostage taking. Well, I'm just not privy to uh, official conversations. <laughs> uh, I'm sure it is being raised. I'm sure the administration um, has raised this as an important issue for allies and partners. Uh, you know, I, I can't cite chapter and verse of what has been uh, announced publicly, but it's, it's clearly um, a major topic of our conversation, both within NATO and in a series of our relationships bilaterally with our allies. But beyond that, I don't think I can really add anything to what is publicly already known. I mean, I guess the question would be, you know, how great do you estimate the threat, the ongoing risk of that to be? It's, 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 a, it's a major threat, and it will remain a major threat. If all of us learned, uh, well, some of us learned in the United States, but it hasn't been just limited to the United States that ransomware attacks or uh, something that can affect our daily lives. When there were you know, major uh, uh, gas station line, lines for gas in the United States earlier this year, and uh, we were by no means unique in that regard. So um, it's, it's going to be a, a, a major issue in part because as we know from materials out in the open press, um, it's not just rogue criminals that are involved in these activities uh, originating from Russia, but also we now have ample evidence of occasionally cozy relationships between Russian organized crime and Russian law enforcement. So um, you know, Russians may bristle at that and say that it's anti-Russian propaganda, but those are investigations conducted by Russian reporters, credible media outlets, which are unfortunately under attack in Russia. But it's going to be a major problem. There's no question about it. So, no, there, there, there are probably, again, I'm not an expert on this, probably ways to go. Certainly, we now know also from open source reporting that there are ways to go after that. And I'm hoping that this is something that is being done. There was a, you know, we can go after crypto. Currency wallets, uh, currency held by organized crime groups, and so on. That's been there's no magic solution here. Thank you. And you introduce yourself. Orissa Lutsevich, I'm the head of Ukraine Forum at Russia and Eurasia program. It's a pleasure to host you here. It's my first actually post COVID uh, real life simulation center event. So great to see all of you. 
Uh, I found a question on Ukraine. Um, it's interesting that you observe that Putin gets his way by blackmailing and you know, creating hostile situ- situation on Ukraine's border from Biden. Could we imagine that Biden could get something from Putin by giving a right policy or playing, in a way, right policy inside Ukraine? Do you think that is understood? Do you think the policy that currently Biden pursues is a Ukraine is enabling U.S. to achieve or have some influence over Russia or not? I mean, if 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 this relationship works one way, you see what I mean? Can it work the other way? I'm, I don't want to objectify Ukraine. I'm the last person to do it. But I'm thinking, are we using all the potential in that partnership? And another one, um, uh, it's interesting you mentioned generation. And I do believe that in Putin's mind, this catastrophe of the USSR was not only the large uh, tragedy, but also it was engineered by the West, right? And that's why I think in this hostility between NATO and Russia, Putin wants to keep relationship in that paradigm. He wants us to stay within that parameter. Can we? What can we do to, in a way, accept ourselves out of it, create a new discourse? Because otherwise we are locked in Putin's framework, not ours. Thank you. Well, thank you. Well, I'm, I'm not sure we can do something to change Putin's mind. Someone who is uh, 69 years old and, you know, by, by, by his, I think, measure has been pretty successful. Uh, I don't think that uh, you can really convince him at this point. And uh, entourage, immediate entourage, is in a circle um, that their worldview is wrong. Um, uh, so I, I, I'm pretty skeptical of that. As far as you know, the policy um, on Ukraine, you know, with the exception of the Trump administration uh, and its policy on Ukraine, I think the Biden administration follows in the footsteps of its predecessors. Um, after now 30 years or so, uh, there is, I would argue, broad recognition, not necessarily a consensus, but broad recognition among people who follow these issues that Ukraine's transition is going to be, has been and will continue to be difficult. It's not going to be a straight line. It's going to be a long line. But there's definitely a vector to it that is quite encouraging. Now, what effect it is having on Russia, um, i trying to remember who said this, possibly Grzynski, since he said so many wise things back in the day, that if you change Ukraine, you can change Russia. I'm not convinced necessarily of that. Um, but I do think that uh, changing Ukraine would have you know, gradual effect. Um, because there's still, as I understand, it, significant people to people ties. And, you know, even though the relationship is in a state of undeclared warfare, um, the, the links have not been severed. And even though the Russian state tries to cut off um, many important information channels on the internet, it hasn't been entirely successful. Uh, so I, I, I do think over time it will, uh, it could have a you know positive effect. But that also I think is built on the premise that Ukraine will continue to evolve in the right direction, uh, which I hope. Introduce yourself. Yes, uh, I'm and Foreign Policy Center. Very good to see you, of course. Thanks, as ever, for, for the uh, insights. Um, a couple of questions, and really picking up on the reg- uh, regional dynamics. Um, first of all, after the Second Karabakh War, yes. I wonder what you see for scope uh, Russian US um, relationship operation with the under the auspices of the, the Minsk group, is it a case of just paying, paying lip service to that? Or do you think that there is an interest on Moscow's um, side, you know, get Turkey questions, Turkey having questions, um, to, uh, to try and re inflate uh, that mechanism? 
question. The, the other one I want to reach on dynamics is really, I suppose, Russia, US, and Afghanistan. Um, I think, you know, as we've seen, Moscow has resisted fully gloating over what um, the do, but clearly, and clearly has key concerns on just gloating, not yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but has key concerns on implications um, for Central Asia. And I'd just be interested in your thoughts on those uh, dynamics, um, uh, particularly the sort of um, paradigm of Russian Chinese interface on Central Asia and Afghanistan. You referred to it being a, you know, a strategic relationship, but I have a sense that um, uh, there's been a marriage of convenience there, but some dynamics can, can shift as China gets more focused on security uh, issues, particularly uh, the uh, Chinese facility, uh, security facility in Tajikistan. Yeah. Thank you. It's very good to see you as well. Um, look, on Nagorno Karabakh and uh, the U.S., um, I have to confess that it's something that I, I mean, it's, it's such a complicated issue um, that unless you really immerse yourself in it, um, you're kind of, uh, uh, you're, you're liable to make yourself look like a fool. Uh, my reading of kind of generally of the situation, I'm perhaps I'm about to make myself sound like a fool, is that um, I don't think the Russians really feel like they need the U.S., to manage their relationship with Turkey, which is um, that, that's that's a separate you know seminar conversation in its own right because it's now occurring in multiple theaters. You know, you have the South Caucasus, you have Syria, you have Libya, and to some extent you have now Central Asia. So it's um, and, and Ukraine. Let's not forget Ukraine. Uh, especially considering the footage just the other day of the uh, Turkish drone flown by Ukrainian uh, Ukrainian military uh, destroying, uh, I think, an artillery piece uh, on, on you know, what was I wasn't going to say on the Russian side, on, on, on the separatist side. The media reports are right. so, um, but I just think that that relationship is something that. Uh, um, Putin can manage views, he can manage on his own. Uh, he doesn't need anybody else. Uh, there will always be, you know, a significant interest on the part of the United States to stay engaged. Um, but um, I am wondering about, you know, what kind of quote unquote drug deals. <laughs> Putin and Erdogan are cooking up between themselves when, when they need to talk about some kind of division of responsibilities or whatever uh, in that. Uh, so um, that's you know the best I can do. Uh, on uh, uh, the Russia, US, Afghanistan, Central Asia, China uh, dynamic, uh, I still remember 10 years ago. Uh, Russia with China sort of behind it worked very hard to get us out of Central Asia. Uh, they succeeded, if I'm not mistaken, in 2014, getting us out of Manas, the transit center there. And they were quite content with that, quite happy with that. So I think any conversation about um, letting the United States a return to Central Asia with any kind of military presence is basically part of what you described as gloating and uh, perhaps enjoying the spectacle or not a public spectacle, but just the experience of having senior US policymakers, including reportedly, I can't speak to them, but it was a reference in, uh, in the press, including President Biden, you know, asking to be led into Central Asia. I don't think it's going to happen. Uh, I think the Russians uh, came to the conclusion a long time ago that the war in Afghanistan would not be won by the United States. Um, they have been maintaining ties to the Taliban for a long time, for well over 10 years, I believe. Um, so I think they can manage the situation okay on their own. 
the fact that the Chinese are developing this capability in the report was ten million dollars to spend on a base. I mean, in Tajikistan, ten million dollars presumably goes a lot further, but still, I can't imagine it's going to be a massive military base. And apparently, they already had some military presence in Tajikistan, if I'm not mistaken. So. Um, I don't think that's an issue for the Russians for the time being. Russians also have presence there. Uh, you see pictures of that on, on you know, Russian websites all the time. Um, you know, you describe that as a marriage of convenience. I think those marriages can work. And I think it's working okay for them so far in Central Asia. I, neither, I don't think, feels that they really need the United States back in the region to deal with threats that may be aimed at the United States, but not necessarily direct, but aimed, but not sort of aimed at their interests. Their understanding of counterterrorism is much more geographically focused uh, than, 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 than ours, which tends to be global. So. We have several questions coming in here. So I'll turn to our audience, um, our virtual audience. Uh, one on sanctions, which is anonymously submitted, but with the role of the Treasury Sanctions Review, how do you assess the administration's approach to sanctions and with regard to Russia moving forward, but also uh, what impact will this have on the emphasis on multilateral coordination have on um, the question of sectoral sanctions, broad sectoral sanctions, or will it likely see less of those? Are there others too, but maybe I'll start that. Yeah, well, um, Again, I mean, we'll have to see how this Treasury sanctions review, uh, what, what kind of policy changes uh, uh, it will trigger. I think the fact of their review is very welcome news. Um, I have been on occasion skeptical about our ability to use sanctions to alter, you know, force other countries to change their behavior, in particular Russia. Um, that has not deterred people in Washington from having some people from Washington, Washington especially in the legislative way from advocating more sanctions uh, and ever more sanctions. And I wouldn't be surprised if more sanctions come out. There's constantly something brewing. And let's face it, you know, there aren't many people in Washington who want to stand up for Russia and really argue the case against punishing Russia. So they have a punishing effect, but they don't have the effect of changing Russian behavior. So we may very well see more of it, uh, not necessarily coming from the administration um, to the extent that you can sort of have, you know, trace some continuity here. Former Secretary of the Treasury, Jack Lew, gave, I thought, was an important speech at the Carnegie Endowment sometime around 2017, maybe 18, about the United States overusing sanctions as a tool of its foreign policy. You know, very much uh, of that view as well. Clearly, my view doesn't count as much. <laughs> but, uh, but I do think that it's become a kind of a cop out uh, in the way we approach countries if we don't wait uh, and their behaviors. They can be an effective tool as, as, a, as a tool for punishment, but not as, a, as, 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 a, as an agent of change. Uh, for that, you need the two track approach that you referred to. It's like, uh, it has worked uh, for a while with Iran, uh, probably the most significant case. Um, I don't believe it's worked very well with Cuba. <laughs> it's not working very well with Russia because Russia has adjusted to uh, the various sanctions. Um, I do hope, just to pick up on one other point that the questioner raised, that this administration clearly is much more interested in and focused on coordinating sanctions between the uh, United States and its allies. Um, I, I think um, it is mindful of the impact that our unilateral sanctions can have on our closest allies and partners. And you mentioned Nord Stream 2. I, I do believe that 
you know, it was the right decision or be not popular everywhere uh, to waive sanctions because I, I think that uh, our relationship with Germany is far more important uh, than anything else that was at stake still in this It is having other impacts, like the fact that the United States doesn't have very many ambassadors. And, and it, you know, it's not clear that you should that you should measure the unintended consequences. Yeah. That shouldn't be unintended consequences because they're small politics. But nonetheless, um, uh, it's not just you know the decision and its impacts in Europe and on Russia and, and, and Europe, but it's also the decision and its impacts in the domestic world. Absolutely, but I would say to that that. Um, you know, we have a pretty capable foreign service. So um, you may not have a politically confirmed ambassador, which is at times uh, damaging, uh, but I don't see that as a tragedy um, that will somehow constrain our ability. Plus, um, in this day and age, when somebody can pick up the phone and call someone else, and the lines are reasonably secure, and the communications between us and our allies are well established, I think. You know, I, I think that challenge is something that we can overcome. And but globally, it's not just, globally, it's not just one right. globally, yes, it is. ambassadors that yes. are being held up. Oh, that, absolutely. Yeah, that's the you know unfortunate side effect of the way. I won't go there. I'm, I'm going to come to uh, I, one of our dear colleagues in the room. I'll let you introduce yourself. Um, and then we have we do have one. So then yes, uh, Mike Maston, you know, teach at Dartmouth and visiting at LSE. And I guess I'm, the impression I'm getting from the conversation is that although the United States is allegedly a pretty powerful state, really has very little instruments and very little leverage here. And can't really drive a wedge between Russia and China. Doesn't have much leverage over Russian cyber attacks. Um, you know, does the United States have any leverage here? Does it have any instruments? What's, what's your sense? Before you answer that, I should say that that is also a question um, that came up from Bo Bolo. Yes. Who said, how, uh, who said, great presentation, balanced and judicious, to reinforce your critique of crude attempts at triangularism, it's worth asking what could the U.S. possibly offer Putin that might lead to a change of heart in the Kremlin? Um, you know, are there any instruments they promises in their vision that they work? So, like minds, great minds. Right. I don't know what the Oh, he is off Chatham House and uh, you know, a I'm distinguished sure. scholar of, among other things, uh, Russian-Chinese relations who've written extensively on the subject and have benefited from his writings over time. So thank you. Um, well, um, you know, I think um, we do have a number of important tools at our disposal, some of which we don't know about. We in this room, for example, we don't know about. So, you know, we have a very robust, from what I read about in the Washington Post, the New York Times, and so on, uh, you know, cybersecurity, offensive and defensive apparatus. Um, and um, we just don't know what's happening in, in, in that domain. Um, I think that's, uh, you know, we see occasionally glimpses of what. United States has done in retribution again, you know, for Russian cyber attacks. So, um, you know, that raises a number of difficult questions that go way beyond my expertise. But a number of American cyber experts, like I'll cite James Lewis, James Lewis from the Center for Strategic International Studies, have spoken uh, and have um, described referred to opportunities that the United States can pursue uh, as both coercive and um, um, punitive uh, steps in, in that domain. Uh, I think our relationship, the triangular relationship with Russia and China is more difficult to handle in a sense because of the way how our Russian counterparts think about their security. Maybe I'm wrong, and maybe there's room for compromise there. 
But so far as I see, you know, uh, to paraphrase what uh, former Speaker of the House Newt Gingrich said a few years ago, who knew that Cowan was in a suburb of St. Petersburg? Uh, that's something that is difficult to compromise on, given our commitment to our allies. So, and that's something that we perhaps should focus on managing. Um, I do think there may be opportunities in bilateral arms control, because notwithstanding um, the breakthrough technologies that Russians like to advertise about their weapons and so on, um, um, I don't think that even in its current self-confident mood, the Kremlin really is interested in helping in their arms race. Uh, and uh, there are occasional hints, signs that you see uh, coming out from the Russian side that they realize perhaps a formal legally binding arms control treaty may not be in the cards, but it's possible to arrive at a uh, you know, mutually acceptable regime of restraint. Restraint is, you know, is actually worth, worth these days in Washington too, but um, uh, th th there's some room for a serious conversation in the strategic stability domain. Uh, you know, there, 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 there is some awakening underway in Russia with respect to climate. Uh, it's not universally accepted and you hear very contradictory messages as one colleague of mine said that, you know, when a Russian expert says that we have 10 years to fix our house in order, somebody in the crowd will say, great, we've got 10 years of this. You know, so, you know, kick that can down the road. Uh, but uh, I think it's worth engaging in a serious conversation. Um, and um, there could be, you know, there could be, you know, there's room there for cooperative relationship. But then there are, um, uh, uh, you know, other issues where we can cooperate, again, not with a view toward dramatically, drastically changing the relationship. Uh, and I'm digressing here into cooperative spheres as opposed to tools that we have. Uh, but I, I think that it's not lost on some very astute Russian observers. We do have a, a channel from what we know to the leadership that just in the space of the last 12 months or so, the United States has deployed something like three times the Russian GDP to boost its economy during COVID. And that kind of economic muscle is not something that I think is lost on some of the more serious people in Russia. And, and there are those serious people in Russia. So I think that is having a certain amount of effect. So um, now on global rules question. Um, uh, I don't you probably you're probably just as well as anybody else equipped to uh, to deal with this um, set of issues. Like, as I referred to before, I don't see a lot of room in our posture toward Russia to mollify, so uh, assuage their concerns. Um, occasionally you hear about some kind of uh, confidence building, steps managing um, the military to military relationship in close proximity with each other. Perhaps that's something that I mean, we certainly should explore. And I hope it is being explored. We don't hear much about the conversation that takes place between our general judge, Jesus staff, General Milley, and his counterpart, General Gerasimov. But I do hope that that conversation is taking place there because otherwise, what else are we talking about? So, I think I'll answer. No, thank you. It's, it's, it's interesting to listen to your answer, uh, especially to the first question, um, in part because I, in reading your work, um, over the past few days, and, and this morning I read the Aaron Hills article, which I might read quickly through, sounded like she attributed so much of it just to, like, there's really nothing to do with the so long as Putin remains. It seemed less of a structural analysis. Yours seems more of a, as you set out, multi part, three part analysis of why things are. 
me. <laughs> she has met me. She has looked him in the eyes. I never have. Uh, so, uh, you know, um, but I do think that, and I give, again, credit to the credit to the administration for working on managing this relationship. So, um, you know, you have the top level channel with the two presidents and there was a hint just recently, only a hint, let's not get overly excited that the two presidents may meet again. This was after, you know, toward the end of Under Secretary Victoria Newland's visit to Moscow just a, what, a week, 10 days ago. So um, I give credit to people like Jake Sullivan uh, for engaging with his counterpart, uh, Mr. Patrushev. Uh, the same goes for General Milley and General Gerasimov. Uh, and Again, sort of secondhand snippets from that, that you know, Deputy Secretary Sherman clearly is personally engaged in this too. So, you know, what we're hearing is that uh, there, you know, there, there's not a warm and fuzzy dialogue between uh, our two uh, governments. Uh, but I think we learned toward the end of the Obama administration and throughout the Trump administration, that dialogue is absolutely necessary. And it's not a favor to the Russians. Uh, it's just something that you have to do because, um, you know, they have a hand in many, many issues where we, the better or worse, do have an important state. They position themselves in the Eastern Mediterranean as an important actor. Um, you know, they're clearly the biggest military in the European theater. So, um, and they can be, I don't see them playing a major role in the Asia Pacific, but they can make themselves um, heard in more of a new system. They have been achieved. So, thank you. We're, so we're coming to the end of our time, but I'm going to take two more questions. Can Please, we both yeah. do it once, and then, and then we will uh, allow you to pause and finish. Yeah. Um, a question from you, but first, before you ask your question, let me read one out from Duncan Allen. Many thanks for your presentation. During the next two to three years, how much influence is the U.S. Congress likely to exert over the direction of U.S. policy towards Russia? So that's your first question. Thank you. I'm Kate Horner, ex-foreign office of Cambridge Office, uh, career observer of Russia, but now retired. A former colleague of Duncan Adams in a great <laughs> conference. <laughs> All right. Um, my, my question was well, partly prompted by Michael's comments. Um, and Eugene, you mentioned yourself um, just, just a moment ago um, a reference to uh, Russian observers who have been channeled to Putin on certain issues and, and by implication of influence. It would be fascinating to, to hear if you have any more sense of who really are uh, influencers on uh, Putin and the Kremlin. Uh, finger on those. Um, and in a related uh, question, I think, um, briefly, there are clearly so many obstacles, political and practical, at the moment to much change. Um, Eric, uh, the, the Russian tales are up, as you've described, um, in the relationship. And I just wonder whether, in, in a sense, they're simply waiting out for the Biden presidency um, and for the pendulum maybe to shift again to. Uh, Slightly more opportunity for productive relationship, which is the most benign. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, thank you, Duncan. Um, uh, you know, Congress plays a huge role in our uh, foreign policy, which is an extension of our domestic politics. Um, and um, I look with a great deal of unease at what may happen next year with our midterm elections um, and um, the fact that uh, 
control of both houses could shift to the other party. Um, and, you know, uh, that is likely to make life more difficult for the administration. Um, Leslie, you pointed out to the fact that uh, score, you know, dozens of American ambassadors nominees have not been confirmed. Um, I can see that becoming the norm, but also the same kinds of uh, obstacles being put up on many other issues having to do with foreign policy, whether or not important uh, stakeholders, important constituencies in our domestic politics, um, but there are constituencies um, um, you know, just take Ukraine related issues. There's a strong constituency for Ukraine, there's no constituency for Russia. So we could see a lot more uh, in terms of sanctions uh, and other measures to uh, you know, to get at Russia to punish Putin and so on. So um, that for sure is something that could be in the cards and could translate Duncan into uh, more sanctions. I'm not sure what's there left to sanction. Uh, in the bilateral relationship a few months ago, somebody proposed to sanction Russ Smith. Now, I wonder, well, yeah, what's that going to do to the price of uh, gasoline at the pump? Uh, uh, so on. So, uh, but, you know, uh, this kind of um, fascination with sanctions and kind of planting the rhetorical flag has never really stopped those in Congress who want to make a point. Um, and uh, this could also affect significantly our transatlantic cooperation on sanctions, our relationship on sanctions, because basically there will be little to stop. The administration will have a few options to counter that momentum um, within the House and the Senate. Uh, so um, in the next two or three years, it's going to be a, a huge issue. Uh, now, um, on the channels to Putin, and, you know, a lot of this is really not transparent. So we go on like little snippets of information uh, and bits and pieces, and you know the ever shrinking Russian public media space. So you know you see some prominent Russian personalities opining on Echo Moscow, for example. Um, about uh, the economic muscle that the United States can deploy in pursuit of its objectives. That's not, it's hardly a secret, but I am, you know, somewhat encouraged, and this is good news, bad news in a sense, um, by the fact that, uh, you know, to give Putin credit, he has maintained, kept in place a team of very competent economic managers who enable him to balance, if you can call it that, uh, between different factions in the Russian elite. And there are people who want to pour more money into the economy, uh, to pour more money into all manner of projects that perhaps would benefit particular corporate interests and so on. Um, and those people he relies on to maintain what he, I believe, considers to be an absolute essential element of Russian national sovereignty, and that's good fiscal discipline and uh, financial health of the Russian state. Um, so, um, you know, the good news here is that uh, he's been able to circle and keep circled, keep them circled the wagons, the fiscal, you know, financial uh, uh, wagons to protect against future shocks. I mean, if you look at sort of how much they're accumulating in reserves, and if you look at the most recent national security strategy that they published, it's all about protecting the sovereignty of the Russian state. And there, I think the scheme of economic policymakers, capable policymakers, uh, plays a very important role. Um, but, you know, the bad news perhaps from perspective of those who, of those who Consider Russian adversary that, that that strengthens Russia, that strengthens Putin's hand. And as far as them waiting out the uh, Biden, you know, I'm, clearly there were champagne corks popping uh, in the Duma uh, after the election. 
in the U.S. Um, but um, I also think that this uh, predictable uh, U.S. posture that was the dominant aspect of U.S. foreign policy during the previous four years was not something that it would so I think the ability to engage in conversation, engage in a managed or manageable relationship with Washington is something that they appreciate. Now, it doesn't mean that they will not interfere in our domestic politics the way they've done over the years and spread all manner of nasty disinformation and so on. Um, but I don't think that they're bidding so squarely on uh, President Trump returning to the White House. Don't believe that that was a, I may be proven wrong, who knows? But I don't think they look at the previous four years as a happy time. Um, of course, you know, if you look at um, who are people who are lining up, and this is more of a question of American politics, prospective candidates who are lining up for 2020. It's not necessarily Mr. Trump, but it's the you know very impressive Republican cohort of Mike Pence, Tom Cotton, Ron DeSantis, uh, Ricky, uh, sorry Nikki Haley, and so on and so forth. And um, that's not going to be a very Russia-friendly uh, uh, um, lineup. So uh, perhaps um, they realize that, and maybe. You know, to a better place, you know, more possibilities, more opportunities <laughs> in the relationship. So uh, we always feel like we need to end on an optimistic note, even though we're, we're not often optimistic <laughs> about this. But it's a good thing it's because we do have to continue to um, lead our lives uh, working in the US and Russia. This was tremendous. It was on the record. Um, thank you to James and Arisia for making it happen, for bringing you to us. Thank you, thank you for making the trip. And uh, joining, please. Actually, clapping our heads. Yeah.